oh, and I'm your substitute today. Uh, I've got to figure out how to use this other computer for a quick second to turn on the uh, slide presentation. And I think I have to do this next. Oh boy. And this. How about that? Okay, there we are. Uh, this talk is going to be a little bit different than the ones that I've traditionally done. For those of you who have come to my talks, you know that I talk about issues that are related to politics or political issues, sometimes some historical issues. Uh, this is going to be a little bit more impressionistic. Uh, I had some friends tell me that uh, it might be interesting to hear about some of the things you did while you were in the federal government and in the military, because there are things that are not always well known by the general population. I said, wow, this sounds great. I get to tell war stories for 45 minutes. So that's a speech that writes itself. Uh, so you're probably looking at this and going, oh, geez, what's up with the balloons? Uh, balloons are fun. Balloons are festive unless you're that balloon. How many of you remember the Chinese surveillance balloon? We're, yeah, we're coming up on one year when we got a visit. I said Chinese surveillance balloon. For those of you who are inclined to believe the Chinese foreign ministry, this was of course a meteorological balloon, which happened to blow off course only coincidentally over the top of your ballistic missile sites in Western Montana. So this is kind of interesting and I wanna use it as a sort of a point of departure for talking about the work that I did in the intelligence community because it involved reconnaissance, sort of what that's doing. So this balloon's pretty amazing. Uh, I know most of you had read about how it was discovered we have NORAD, we have all the fancy radar systems and satellite systems. But in fact, this balloon was discovered by a guy in Montana who looked up in the sky one day and said, it's a bird, it's a plane. Oh no, it's a Chinese surveillance balloon. And he called it in and the government kind of went, what? And uh, there's a reason, by the way, why that balloon was not readily detected by our own um, collection uh, capabilities, and that is because there are lots of balloons out there, that, some of which are actual meteorological balloons and scientific balloons and so forth. And believe it or not, the, the military had decided to filter out large, slow-moving things like balloons. So they didn't really focus in on those because they were unlikely to pose a threat you know, to the United States. But this balloon was really something, 200 feet tall. Okay, that's like from here to the other side of the uh, the lawn bowling uh, uh, court. Is that right, court, field? Uh, that's, a, that's a big balloon, 140 feet wide. And the payload, which you can see in this photo here, was the size of a regional jet. Uh, it weighed about 2,000 pounds. Most of it was the solar panels that powered it. And it was, of course, an intelligence collection package. Uh, this was very um, concerning to the United States because of where it was going, as I said, over, over some of our sensitive military sites. So how high up was it? This is a, a, an illustration of how high in the sky it was. 60,000 feet, so here's some perspective for you. Uh, Jetliners cruise around 35 to 40 thereabouts. That's the jet below. Our F-16 fighters a little bit higher up. And then our premier air defense fighter, the F-22, flies up around the 60,000 foot level, and that's where the surveillance balloon was. Of course, we have planes that go higher, and that would be the U-2 spy plane, about which I'm going to talk a little bit more later. So that's where the balloon was located. And uh, here is a document that the Washington Post recently put online. 
I know it's hard to see the, intel the classification markings, but it has some very sensitive classification markings. But this was a document leaked by Jack Tejera, an Air National Guard intelligence analyst who thought it would be cool to impress his friends online. And he went on the Discord platform and he dumped a bunch of documents about which one of these was this one. Uh, and uh, th those are called the Discord leaks, which you may have read about. So you can see that the um, United States had a pretty good idea what this intelligence package consisted of. But uh, members of Congress had a different impression. Uh, there was a lot of hand wringing. I mean, here comes a balloon. You should shoot it down. But when you're talking about an intelligence collection package that weighs 2,000 pounds, the last thing you need to see happen is this thing comes down in a schoolyard or in a uh, parking lot of a shopping mall and kills a bunch of people. So the United States knew what it was and what it was doing, and it you know, turned off sensitive things and covered up stuff that we didn't want it to see, and we allowed it to continue along its way. So uh, that is... That is what happened with that particular balloon. And at this point, I'd like to digress for a minute because I think it's interesting to look at the use of balloons for military purposes over the ages. By the way, this is a picture of the balloon taken from one of our U-2 spy planes. That's a pretty good shot up in the air, about 60,000 feet. So we had a pretty good idea what it was doing. So um, the first use of balloons by the military was, was actually by the French army in the, in the late 18th century. This was right after the French Revolution. Austrian forces in this case were attacking in what is today Belgium. And this balloon was used in the Battle of Fleurus near Chalois, which is part of Belgium today, and was used to do a little surveillance of the disposition of Austrian forces because up high they got a nice view. So people said, hey, this is really cool. So the uh, skip ahead to the Civil War, American Civil War, and we also used balloons. The Union Army had a balloon called Intrepid, and this photo is a Matthew Brady photo. It's an actual photo of the Intrepid being inflated. And this was also used for the same purpose, to go up high, look and see what the enemy forces were doing. But we had one major general in the um, uh, Union Army who wanted to uh, take a look at this himself. And in those days, these balloons were tethered to the ground with three or four ropes, and then they just went up and they looked. General Porter said, well, I want it to go up higher and faster, so he only tethered it to one rope. And guess what happened? The rope snapped, and then the wind blew the balloon over Confederate lines. And this is a problem. So Confederate sharpshooters were shooting at it, but were unable to bring it down. And lucky for General Porter, the wind shifted, and the balloon drifted back over Union lines, and he was able to, to land safely. I thought that was kind of an interesting story. Um, balloons in World War I were very much used by all of the combatants. This is a balloon from Austrian forces. They were allied with Germany. Uh, the balloons were not only used for surveillance, for reconnaissance, for looking at what the other guys were doing in their trenches uh, and so forth, but they started to use them to direct artillery fire. And so this is why these balloons were a priority target for a new technology in World War I, which was the airplane. During World War II, balloons had another mission, uh, and these were to prevent or inhibit bombers from attacking cities, ports, uh, factories and so forth, and they were called barrage balloons. And here is a photograph in London of balloons that were uh, sent aloft, and you may remember some of these pictures from your history. And what made them effective is that dive bombers would come down and they could get tangled up and it was very hard for them. So, uh, so they were 
foot all over. There was an actual balloon command in Great Britain. 1,400 balloons were produced, and a third of these were deployed, deployed in London. Here's another photograph of where balloons were deployed during World War II. This is uh, over the Normandy landing zone after we uh, landed in Nor Normandy and were uh, uh, bringing supplies in on the beach. And it's hard to see that, but there's a couple of balloons a little bit more in the foreground of this, of this photo. Now, I also want to talk about this for a second, because this was a very unique use of balloons. This was Operation Fugo by the Japanese. What they did was they constructed these very large balloons, and they put incendiary devices and some high-explosive anti-personnel uh, bombs on the uh, large balloons. Now, in those days, the um, jet stream was not especially well understood by scientists, but the Japanese knew there was the jet stream. That's basically it. And so they put these balloons aloft with the idea that they would float over the United States and would land and start fires in the forests. And the explosive devices might land and kill people and terrorize the population. And this was called Operation Fugo, or Japanese fire balloons. Now, as it happened, uh, most of these probably ended up in the ocean, but there were officially recorded 285 that made it to the United States. The only one that uh, caused a lot of problems was a balloon that landed in Oregon that killed six people, the explosive device. The bigger threat was the incendiaries, which could start fires, uh, but only one person was reported killed by fires started by the Fugo uh, balloons. There were Fugo balloons in Sonoma County sighted. Out east of Forestville, one came down near an orchard, and that was kind of interesting. Uh, about two weeks later in early 1945, a Fugo balloon was sighted over the Mayakamas here. So the Army Air Corps dispatched a P-38 from Santa Rosa Army Airfield, which is now where Charles Schultz International Airport is located, and sent the P-38 up and they shot the balloon down. So there you go, Sonoma County. So one thing about balloons, whether it's uh, party balloons or Chinese surveillance balloons is that they can be popped. So after the Chinese balloon made its way across the United States, the U.S. at that point when it crossed over into the ocean sent an F-22 fighter up and they shot the balloon down. And they immediately recovered uh, stuff from the, uh, from the intelligence collection package and what's interesting is that um, it was reported, although maybe didn't get a lot of coverage, but when chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, Mark Milley left office, he made an announcement that we knew for a fact that the Chinese were not collecting intelligence during the time that the balloon passed over. So you may say, well, that sounds self-serving, but that's probably for two reasons. One is, that it almost certainly had a self-destructed uh, device on board, and the Chinese probably communicated that to its balloon because the balloon was maneuverable, and they probably destroyed most of the intelligence stuff so it wouldn't fall in American hands. Uh, but the other reason is because um, we have the ability to tell whether that balloon was communicating with anybody, and so they probably knew that it was not, uh, for whatever reason, and then they recovered the, the the payload package. So this is what it looked like. It took this route from January 31st to February the 4th and was shot down just off the coast of South Carolina. So that long digression was to lead into the work that I used to do, and I wanted to talk about it real quick. Um, and that is 
that intelligence collection balloon, as well as other things that governments are involved in, is something, uh, one of it is, is signals intelligence. Signals intelligence is this. It's the intercept of signals, whether it's communications between people or signals not directly used in communications. That includes radar telemetry and other signals across the radio frequency spectrum. So I'll give you an example of how that might be used today. Uh, as you know, the United States undertook strikes against Houthi rebel positions in Yemen. Uh, the Houthis were taking pot shots at cargo ships going through the Red Sea. Um, we would be able to collect signals from the radars that they use to be able to guide their missiles. Uh, and that would tell us where those radars are located and you can go and strike them. That's just a modern example of signals intelligence. Uh, other notable SIGINT programs that, that many of you are familiar with from World War II history. Uh, that was the program at Bletchley Park that decrypted intercepted messages coded by the German cipher machine known as Enigma. And this allowed us to exploit uh, the highest levels of encrypted communications of the German armed forces, and the Germans didn't know we were doing it, which was very important. That's why it was one of the co most closely guarded secrets. And the intelligence produced was known as Ultra. There's a lot of books written about this. There's some very good movies, but most of you know about that. Uh, but what is somewhat less known is the intercept and decoding of Japanese Navy codes, which allowed us to conduct several successful operations, including at Midway. But another one that was really interesting, but not well known, was we were also exploiting Japanese diplomatic traffic. And this provided allied commanders with great insights into German military strategy in Europe. So how did that work? Well, Japan and Germany were allied and Japanese diplomats would go to Berlin and they would meet with their counterparts and they would learn what the Germans were kind of up to, what they wanted to do, how the Japanese might help and vice versa. Then the Japanese would send a coded cable back to Tokyo which we were reading in near real time. And so we knew, geez, that's what the Germans are up to. So that was why SIGINT is so important and so valuable and why it's sensitive because those sources go away as soon as the adversary knows that you're exploiting them. So there's another type of intelligence collection which the Chinese balloon was engaged in or wanted to be engaged in. And that's the analysis of imagery or geospatial information. Back in my day, it was just imagery intelligence or photo intelligence, but now we've got fancy words because it's much more sophisticated. So it's not only pictures, but it's also physical features, things like that. And obviously the most common examples are photographs. So this um, you recognize is a U-2, the U-2 spy plane, developed at the Lockheed Skunk Works in the 1950s. You know, the U-2s are still going today. That's how valuable this aircraft has been. Uh, but it does some different missions. In those days, we were flying the U-2 directly over the Soviet Union, over their strategic rocket forces sites, and collecting intelligence. Finally, in 1960, after many attempts, the Soviets were able to shoot a U-2 down. And the unfortunate pilot was Francis Gary Powers. Uh, the Soviets actually fired 14, 14 SA-2 missiles at Gary Powers' aircraft. One of them hit. Another one of the missiles hit a MiG-19 that was also sent up to try to get to Gary Powers. So they finally shot him down and he was able to parachute safely and was eventually exchanged for the Soviet spy Rudolf Abel. Probably the most famous historically uh, of U-2 uh, uh, intelligence collection photos was over Cuba during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. This is an actual photo of the medium-range ballistic missile site at San 
Cristobal in Cuba, and we were able to definitively conclude that the Russians, the Soviets, were putting missiles in Cuba. And so that was collected from U2. Uh, today, of course, most of the good intelligence we get, SIGINT, uh, imagery and so forth, comes from our spy satellites. But there's still value for aircraft because satellites are very high up there. And no matter how good they are, there's still there's some distance issues. Also, satellites are going around the Earth like this, aren't they? Not quite this fast, but they're going around. So they are over the target area for five minutes, six minutes, three minutes, right? And then they're, you know, over South Africa or something. So that means that you don't have long-term look at your target. Uh, we do have spy satellites that are in geosynchronous orbit, which means they're over a spot and they move with the Earth like this. Well, that's good, except those are way, way up there. And so the farther you're away, the less you know, fidelity you get on the collection. So there is still some value for what we call the air-breathing reconnaissance platforms. Um, mm -hmm. Before I talk about those, I wanted to explain another example, modern terms, about this geographic features capability when we talk about geo-intelligence. This, of course, is the uh, Bin Laden's compound at Abbottabad. And before our special forces team went in to take out bin Laden, the United States intelligence geoint was able to create a mock-up of this facility for them to practice on. And so the detail necessary, that's all geo-intelligence collected from however we did that. So that was a modern example of geo-intelligence. Now back to the uh, air breathing. So this is an Air Force RC-135 reconnaissance jet. Does this airframe look familiar to anybody? Well, it's built on the Boeing 707 platform, isn't it? That's a Boeing 707, not, not quite as old as that, but, but just like the U-2 in the 50s, the Boeing 707 was designed in the 50s as well. But this is a more modern version. And this platform, has linguists in the back who are dialing up. We fly missions not over these countries, our adversaries, but nearby, for instance, like in the South China Sea. And they are listening to, you know, the uh, adversary communications. Chinese don't like it. So they have been sending up fighter aircraft and buzzing our reconnaissance aircraft, flying extremely close in a very unsafe way. And one of these days, there's going to be another collision. And why do I say another collision? Because it's already happened. Many of you may recall, I, I should have got the date, it's about 20 years ago now, but a Chinese fighter ran into a Navy uh, Poseidon reconnaissance aircraft, and the aircraft had to make an emergency landing in Chinese territory on Hainan Island. And then there was a big rumpus between the United States and the Chinese about getting the aircraft and the people back. But in this case, this photograph is very good. Look how close the uh, fighter aircraft is. And the little trick that they're doing now is they fly directly in front of our aircraft, which which means that our aircraft have to fly into its wake turbulence. And for those of you in the aviation world, if you've ever gotten hit with wake turbulence, it'll definitely get your attention. Uh, I remember having that happen once on a commercial flight to Japan out of Portland, and I thought there was a bomb went off, and I had a near heart attack. Fortunately, I was young enough to survive that experience. And then about 10 minutes later, the captain sort of, you know, wanders down the aisle. And I go, hello, what was that? And then he explained to me 
that we had been following and trail another 747 aircraft, and that was wake turbulence. We were a little bit too close, not too close to it, but too much in alignment for the wake turbulence off the aircraft. And that can happen. Because by the way, as you well know, flights over the Atlantic particularly, but also over the Pacific, go over certain routes like highways. They don't just go every which way and then get to Japan or go every which way and get to Paris. They, they go over very specific routes like highways. So sometimes the planes are kind of lined up like directly behind each other. So wake turbulence. So this is a problem. And I just raised this because this could one day result in an accident or something that will create a very major confrontation between the United States and China. The Russians are doing it too, by the way. Okay, changing subjects. How many people recognize this? Do you know what this is? What? Do you know where this is? Huh? Nevada. No. Okay. Well, it's right down the street. This is Skaggs Island. Anybody know what was going on at Skaggs Island? Skaggs Island was an intelligence collection facility operated by the Navy. And this is their version of an high frequency, it's, it's actually a, a flare uh, 10 uh, antenna array, and it collects uh, uh, HF signals, high frequency signals, signals in the HF frequency range from very great distances. And it was used for direction finding. Also some other things, they would collect any, any kind of signals that were uh, of interest. And direction finding to know like when there's ships out there, you know, off in the coast in the Pacific. Now this goes back many years when HF was a very common communication method. This is way before Google and, and all the high tech stuff that we have today. But these were very big. The Air Force version of these was the Flare 9, which, whose nickname was an elephant cage, because that's what they looked like. And they were deployed in Misawa, Japan, at Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines, in Udon, Thailand, in Chicksands in Great Britain, Augsburg, Germany, San Vito, Italy, Paramacel, Turkey. What do all these places have in common? They're not too far away from China and Russia, right? Okay, and so what were they doing? Well, this picture might as well have been taken on the ops floor where I worked as a flight commander for the Air Force back in 1979, right down to the authentic uniforms. Because in fact, it's not a photo that I took, but this is exactly what it looked like. And what you had here were Morse intercept operators. They were guys trained to listen to this all day. And they would type what was being done. And that was intelligence because our adversaries were using HF. They were especially using HF for their air defense nets. And why that it's important, of course, is that told us where their aircraft, their fighter aircraft, their bombers and so forth were going. So we were all kind of surrounded them and they would do this. And this was uh, quite the job uh, to do that. And, and I, I like this photograph, it's off the internet. So before anybody gets their phone out and calls the FBI, this is, these pictures are not, not classified pictures that I snuck out, but that's exactly what these guys did all day. We also had linguists who did similar kind of work. I had Korean linguists because I was stationed at Osan, south of Seoul, Korea. And that was a very important uh, collection site. Uh, I also had a couple of Chinese linguists. Um, it was always kind of interesting. I think I had three women, young women, uh, who are Chinese linguists. And there wasn't much of a Chinese mission. It was mostly Korean. But it was kind of interesting once in a while, I'd go back walking on the ops floor and here's this blonde haired, blue eyed 20 year old talking to her, her uh, colleague, um, you know, it'd be like, uh, it was very disconcerting to see this. You didn't expect that they would be speaking together in Chinese. Um, so, uh, so that was what we did. Uh, one other kind of interesting story about 
the Korean linguists that I had working working for me there. Uh, as a second lieutenant, you, you're the senior officer on the watch floor, and you say, well, how could a second lieutenant with so little experience get that job? The reason is they needed somebody that they could fire in case something went wrong. And, and they couldn't fire any of these guys because they're very important. They're highly trained. And they certainly weren't going to fire any linguists. So they had idiots like me who were like, you know, second lieutenants running around. So anyway, but uh, I remember, and, and some of you may relate to this, maybe not, uh, but if you served in the military, you know, outside the military bases, particularly in Asia, there would be clubs and there would be young women who were hostesses at the clubs that would sit behind the bar and, and fetch drinks for you. And they would talk to you. Um, and uh, so one day I'm sitting and having a drink and very, very precocious young woman spoke excellent English and she was very nice. And at one point she, she kind of leaned forward and she said, you know, I'm surprised how many American boys speak Korean. And I was like, wow, you don't say. And then she said, very conspiratorially, and they speak it with a North Korean accent. She couldn't, couldn't quite figure that out. Okay, so as I said, I wanted to go back to the U2. This is what the modern U2s look like. They're still going. We still use them. We used them to go chase down the Chinese balloon, didn't we? U2s are very interesting aircraft because they fly very high. The pilots have to wear a spacesuit. And this is an example. It's not an example. It's an actual mission. Look how small the cockpit is. Okay, very small. And these guys, these missions, eight hours. And they're just doing slow figure eights out in the ocean near target countries. That's a tough, tough day at the office. Okay, another view. You can see out the side there what the Earth looks like from that altitude. And that's what it looks like. Notice the curvature of the Earth. They're flying at a very high altitude. Okay. And this is actually Osan Air Base where I was, but not when I was there. So this is a little bit later. And uh, the interesting thing is the chase car, uh, which has a U-2 pilot in it. And the reason is this aircraft does not have good vision for the pilot. And he has enormous wingspan. So when he lands... He can't see very well what things and where are, they're going if his wings are going to hit the ground and cause a problem. So there's this chase car that goes screaming down the runway after the, the plane lands, and he tells the guy whether he has to go left, right, or whatever. So those operations were very, very interesting. They were for me anyway. Okay, this is the National Security Agency and located between Baltimore and Washington, D.C. That's the B.W. Parkway there to the upper left. Uh, when I worked there, the only thing there was the tan uh, high-rise building, the tan one, with the little buildings around it, the big um, building with the, the black, uh, black windows was not there. NSA has grown quite a bit. But this is the headquarters of the signals intelligence sort of enterprise for the United States. Uh, this is the NSOC, or the National Security Operations Center. After I left Korea, I was sent and I worked a couple of different assignments within the NSA. Um, and one of them was to serve as the operations briefer for the director. Another job for lieutenants, you know, to be a talking dog and, and so forth. So that was my job. And what it meant was I would get up at 2, 2 a.m. and go into the NSOC, which in my day looked like that. These are all photos off the internet. Not personal photos, don't worry. Okay, so that's what it looked like. And uh, I would go in, and we would build this briefing with the staff that was working overnight. And there were two parts. There was what we called the news, which was one of the briefers, which was a woman, was doing uh, you know, the latest intelligence information about this, that, and the other thing. And I would do strictly kind of an operational thing about our systems and their status and so forth. Well, of course, summer came, and then she went on vacation. Mark, you need to do both things. So there I am now coming in at 1 o'clock in the morning, dead exhausted, and they would help me put this together. But I had a piece of luck. 
at the week that I was there, there was a big event that happened in the intelligence world, and that was this. That was when the Israelis bombed the Osirak nuclear reactor in uh, Iraq. And so I got to brief that. And not only that, I had a photograph, not this photograph, but a photograph similar with the bomb damage. This was cool. I could walk down and hand it to General Farr. I was the hero. So that was kind of my claim to fame on, on briefing. So what happened? I, I, I left the Air Force and took a job as a civilian on the Army staff, intelligence staff at the Pentagon. And I just wanted to show you this picture for one reason. There's a cafe or snack bar in the middle. No one knows its real name, but it's popularly known as Ground Zero Cafe. So you can imagine why. Okay. So after working, uh, that's where I got in on the ground floor of working terrorism. At the time, terrorism was nothing, uh, as it, not a particularly important national security issue. In fact, the colonel I had worked for joked after I briefed him on something. He said, Mark, this terrorism, what a cottage industry. So, but I was, you know, I was all pumped up because this is, this is what I did. So uh, after um, it started growing, the Federal Aviation Administration was building out its intelligence staff because it wanted to know more about threats to civil aviation. And where this became critically important was in 1988 when the uh, uh, Pan Am 103 was blown up over Lockerbie, Scotland. And that was a terrible, terrible attack. And so suddenly now the FEA was getting a lot more money and a lot more attention. Here are security measures that were implemented after uh, the 103 bombing, tense fight screening of baggage, refocus on passenger bag match, R&D and so forth, passenger profiling, questions about the purpose of one's trip. Do you remember that when you flew? Why are you here in Paris? You know, you had to talk to him about that. And you guys remember that? I, it's a little less now than it used to be, but still there. And very importantly, additional aviation security personnel to monitor security and conduct inspections. So Mark gets a new assignment off to Brussels, Belgium to serve in our Europe, Africa, and Middle East regional office and conduct inspections throughout the region. And then after my tour there, I joined our FAA red team and red team was job. And this was without a doubt, the greatest job uh, in the 20th century for a government employee. I conducted covert assessments of security of US airports and air carriers operating within the US and abroad. What does that mean? That means I got to travel all over the world, Paris, Tokyo, London, you name it, I went. And we would do these covert assessments. Nobody knew we were going in there. And the whole objective was this. When our inspectors were there, the airlines were always doing what they were supposed to do. But what happens when they didn't think we were there? This is what we wanted to know. And that was very important so that we could say, hey, you know, a couple of things. Not only, you know, to an airport or a carrier, you're not doing what you're supposed to do but also maybe determine whether or not our regulation was even practical. And maybe we needed to think of something else. So it was very, very uh, interesting work. So that would be a picture of me, which one of those looks like me. Well, of course, if you're looking at the first guy in line looking up in the sky, uh, that wouldn't be very good because most people would not suspect me of being a terrorist. And as it was, no matter how I dressed or how I acted, it was very hard to get the security people to think, to do the right things, because they just assumed I was a business traveler or a tourist or something. So, uh, you know, because then when they would do the interview questions, you know, you, you all remember those, right? They, they look like this. Did you pack your own bag? And I would answer, uh, no. Okay, fine, have a nice flight. You laugh. Do you know how many times I ran into stuff like that? I would deliberately put 
suspicious signs into the system. And they would not react to it. And that was not the point, was it? You know, why bother ha you know, asking the questions and doing that if they weren't going to follow the protocols? Why do the protocols matter? How many people recognize this guy? Farouk Abdul Muttalib, the famous underwear bomber. 19-year-old Nigerian flying from Ghana via Amsterdam to Detroit. He was making an interline transfer in Amsterdam to a Northwest flight. He was carrying an explosive device in his underwear. We had a requirement that he would be questioned. And interestingly enough, Farouk had no check bags. He's flying from Africa to the United States and he has no check bags. What's wrong with that picture? What's the first question that a security officer would want to ask for somebody flying that far away to the United States? Well, clever one's gonna ask this. How long are you gonna be in the United States? See what he says. And then you spring the trap. Then why do you have no check bags? You know, if he says two weeks, one week, what's the deal? That is on the list of suspicious signs that TSA, because now TSA was in charge of security, on the list of suspicious signs that security officers were supposed to react to was transcontinental, transoceanic flights, no check bags. Okay have to resolve that. How do you resolve that? He goes, well, here, I'm just carrying this carry-on and it's like a 50 pound carry-on. <laughs> okay, that's, you know, that may be doing it. So we have this guy and he has no check baggage. So in Amsterdam at that time, the um, security questions were asked by a contractor employed by the Dutch government, not by the airlines, which is typical. She lets him go. And of course, while he's on the flight, as they're approaching Detroit, he then tries to ignite the device. And fortunately for the people on that plane, there was an alert passenger who jumped on him and started pulling the device away. It, it was already starting to pop and starting to light up, okay? And his name was Jesper Sharinga. How many people have heard of his name? Had he been an American, everybody would know his name. He would have been up on the top floor in the gallery at the next State of the Union address and being acknowledged by the president. But he was a Dutch citizen from the island of Curacao. So no Americans know about him but he got burned over a big portion of his body, saving everybody on that flight. But the teaching point here is, those things were the very thing I did in red team covert assessments. I would walk in with no check bags, ready for my flight to the United States, hoping security would ask me the questions. Of course, you don't even have to fiddle around with somebody like this. You just make them a select D. What does that mean? That means they go and get extra scrutiny, searching very carefully any bags they have, either a pat down search, or as luck would have it in Amsterdam, they had advanced technologies. The advanced technologies you walk in, you know, it's the one that does this. Guess what it detects? If there's something here, that technology would have found it, he would have been caught and off. But that security officer failed to do it. So that's why we did these assessments, but what are you gonna do? Okay, that's an example. All right, well, here's another thing I used to do. That's not me, but that's exactly what I would do. I would dress up like a ramp rat. I'd piggyback behind somebody, sneak out onto the ramp, see if I could piggyback behind somebody. Or the easiest way to do it was while a flight was boarding, I would just walk down the jetway and the people working the flight saw me in my ramp rat outfit and just assumed I was a 
I was a maintenance guy. No, I had no badge. And again, the, the, you know, the, there was a requirement that people have to have badges and that you check the badges. You don't let anybody get out on the ramp where I could put something into the, uh, into the engine or put something into the um, hold of an aircraft and cause a disaster. So those are, again, some of the red team type assessments that I did. And finally, the last one, I won't belabor it, but I did some operational testing that led to, and that's another story, but I'm looking at the clock and I need to won't wind up and I have a few things to do. But that's those uh, very big uh, check baggage screening devices, right? And I was involved in, in, in the operational testing for that. Okay, so everything changed again on 9-11. Uh, I show you this terrible picture because everybody sees the World Trade Center and people kind of forget there was a terrible tragedy at the Pentagon as well. And that's where the plane hit. And if you look to the left on the D-ring, that's where my office was when I worked at the Pentagon, but that was many years before. Okay, so the Transportation Security Administration was created. I became one of the first federal security directors. Then I went on to the Department of Homeland Security. I'm kind of going a little bit quickly here because I talked a little bit too much on the other stuff. But I had a chance at the Department of Homeland Security, I was a director of counterterrorism planning, to do some interesting things. This was setting up the special flight rules for control of the airspace around Washington, D.C. Um, the other thing was the counterterrorism planning, uh, working with the NSC's counterterrorism security group. And I had a chance to go to meetings three or four times a month uh, at the White House here in the West Wing to the White House Situation Room. And you all received a terrific briefing from uh, Clark Lystra about the White House Situation Room. How many people attended that? Wasn't that great? Um, how many of you knew that Clark owns a heritage vineyard out in the Russian River Valley? Anyway, uh, you see what I'm focused on now in retirement. Um, so this is the entrance into the closest to the White House Situation Room, and it was really great because, you know, you'd be going in for your meeting, and there's Condoleezza Rice and Bob Gates and a big discussion as you walk by, and you're like, oh, this is cool. You know, when you're a, 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 a mid-level bureaucrat, that's, that's big potatoes. Okay, so this is uh, what one of the uh, conference rooms looks like. I said one of them because there is not a single room. There is a bunch of conference rooms where people meet and then they bring the cone of silence down. Get smart. Hello. Okay. I'm, I know I'm boring people now when, when that joke falls flat. Okay. So, uh, but there's also some other components of the White House Situation Room. Uh, and when it's full up with uh, the senior people, I was never invited to a meeting like this. You'll notice who's on the back bench back in the Obama administration. How many people see Tony Blinken there? Tony Blinken with jet brown hair, not white hair. Okay, there's some very uh, interesting folks there. Um, but what I wanted to share with you was that photo because this is the famous photo of the senior people getting the updates on the uh, bin Laden raid, right? Everybody's seen this photo. But what you may not have thought about is, wait a minute, what, ha what happened to that fancy conference room over there? Why weren't they in there? And the answer is that because different military uh, services and intelligence agencies all had slightly different communication modes, there was no one, they didn't cycle into that conference room. There was only this little conference room where they could bring all of this communications in. And so that's why they're all crowded into this almost closet sized space. So as a result of that, there has been a $52 million program to completely modernize and upgrade and Clark may have referred to it, but that's, that's the reason why they did that. Okay, last thing I wanna talk about here is the work I did in emergency management things. And I mean, catastrophic emergency management stuff. Does everybody recognize this? Yes, Cheyenne Mountain in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Yeah, that's what Cheyenne Mountain looks. That's what it looks like 
where you enter to where NORAD and Space Command have their special command centers. And this is where, you know, the airspace of Canada and the United States are closely watched for nuclear missiles or bombers, uh, maybe Chinese surveillance balloons, maybe not. Uh, this is the entrance. And it's quite an interesting place. It has these enormous blast doors and it's set up to be able to resist like a six megaton nuclear device and to resist a electromagnetic pulse. It's very, very survivable. And the command center sits on these giant springs so that if there's, it's hard, it ch -ch -ch. so it's really quite something. And this is the command center. I was surprised how small it is actually. This is not my photograph. It came off the internet, uh, but that's what it looks like. And it looks like any other command center anywhere in the United States government. Okay, this is uh, the Pentagon's special survivable alternate location called Site R. Uh, I have not had a chance to go there, uh, but this is a picture of it from there taken by, by somebody, but it's on the internet. Okay, uh, you may recall that after 9-11, uh, the vice president, Dick Cheney, was sent to a, quote, undisclosed location. This was the undisclosed location where he hung out for several weeks. Okay, and here's another one. And this is the one that I worked. This is called Mount Weather. It's located a little over 60 miles from Washington, D.C. and the Virginia country. And it has a, another survivable alternate um, uh, emergency command post. It's called the Mount Weather Emergency Operations Center, operated by FEMA, and it's the relocation site for the highest level of civilian and military officials in case of national disaster. I'm talking nuclear war, I mean, things that are just catastrophic. And the programs that would be operated there are the continuity of operations and continuity of government programs. This is what it's like when you go in, those portals have radiation detection, explosive detection, show them your badge in you go. I show this here, this is area B where you enter to go into the mountain. The reason is there's a electrified fence around it. It is charged to deadly uh, voltage. And they tell you, don't even get close to this thing. And every now and again, you'll see dead deer along the side there, the deer that didn't get the memo. Um, so what is continuity of operations? It's an effort by the individual departments to continue to do their, their functions for the people of the United States in the event of a national catastrophe. And continuity of government is slightly different. It's the program to ensure the survivability of the constitutional form of government. Okay. And when I say the enduring form of constitutional government, I mean the executive branch, which is the president, the cabinet departments, the Congress, that's part of constitutional government, and the federal judiciary. So it's not only the presidency. We're worried about all three branches, and that's what I worked. I worked the continuity of government. I was part of something called the National Emergency Management Team. It has a new name now, maybe has yet, an, yet another new name, but at the time I worked, it was called the National Emergency Management Team. So what's interesting, and one of the big issues we deal with is presidential succession. Here's some of the quotes of what it is. The vice president is definitively the successor. So how many times has that been invoked? Anybody wanna guess a number? In American history, how many times has the vice president succeeded the, the president? Five, four, nine times. Okay, I'm running out of time, so I won't try to show off with my trivia knowledge with which nine times it was, but four times by natural death of a president, four times following the assassination, and once by presidential uh, resignation. So what is the order of succession after the vice president? What happens if the president and the vice president were to die? Who's next? Speaker of the House. Who's next after that? Senate pro tem of the Senate. Does anybody know who that is? 
It's not Schumer. It is Senator Patty Murray from Washington. The Senate pro tempore is typically the most senior senator of the party that's in the majority. It is not the Senate majority leader. Okay, so there you go. Good job for those of you. Followed by the cabinet secretaries in the order in which their departments were established. So I'm gonna show you this real quick. Obviously here is the current succession. Speaker of the House is Mike Johnson, President Pro Tempore, Senator Patty Murray, and then it is the cabinet departments. Now you'll notice there's a couple of asterisks. The first is under Secretary of Labor, Julie Su. Why is that? There's an asterisk. It's not 100% clear if she would be in the order of succession because she has not been officially confirmed by the Senate. So this would pose for those of us that worked on the team in an emergency, and, and if it, it just happened that all the others in front of her got killed, we would be sitting there saying, is she legal or not? So there would be lawyers arguing on both sides of that. And then you'll go down and see two other asterisks. One is for um, Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm, and then Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas. Why is it that they have an asterisk? The answer is, Jennifer Granholm was born in Vancouver, British Columbia, and she moved to the United States as a very small child. And she is a US citizen, has been forever, but there's an old arcane part of the US uh, constitution that says that a president must be native born, must be native born. And Alejandro Mayorkas was born in Havana, Cuba, and came to the United States when he was six months old and became a citizen very, very, as a child. But neither of them would be allowed to serve. Okay, so believe it or not, I'm almost done. I cannot wrap up a presentation that talks about reconnaissance without talking about Vladimir, the Russian spy whale. He was first discovered in, two, I mean, the Russians have reconnaissance too. See, in 2019, he was found by Norwegians because he was pestering their fishing boats. And so they grabbed onto him and they saw around his neck, he had this thing. And it said in Russian, made in the St. Petersburg factory or something like this. And what the Norwegians are pretty sure is that this was a program by the Russian Navy to train whales to do some spy work or something. So that's Vladimir. So I just wanted to show you him. I'm done finally. May I take your questions? Thanks for sitting through Thanks, this. Thanks, Mark. We'll be passing around the mic for question and answer. Judy and I will both be doing it, I think, here. And do we have any questions for Mark? It's okay if you don't. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> hey, Mark, what's going on right now um, with the um, intelligence of, of this? Maybe the war is going to spread in the Middle East? The, the what? The war that's going on right now. It, do you see that it's going to... Uh, not be contained and it's going to move to other countries? Well, that's, yeah, I, I'm not sure I want to speculate about that. Um, it is already kind of expanded outside of Israel and Gaza. As you know, you have the Houthis in alliance with the Palestinians who are taking shots at shipping in the Red Sea. And finally, the United States, Britain, and our allies have said, look, that you know, shipping on the high seas is very important, the freedom of navigation, and they've attacked the Houthis. So there's that. So that's an expansion. Right. Then Hezbollah, also an Iranian proxy, has been making several attacks in northern Israel. And the Israelis have evacuated some towns along the border with Lebanon. And so we're watching that very carefully. That's why the United States put two aircraft carriers there. They kind of want to put everybody on notice that, you know, we want to try to contain this. So that, I, that's as much as I think I am comfortable saying about it, other than just, you know, what I might do at the bar over beers. <laughs> well, I'll get you a beer later on. Uh, questions I see. Okay, go ahead. After 9-11, um, Homeland Security was created. And one of the reasons was to keep from having silos of the various entities that make up 
Homeland, Homeland Security at that time. In your estimation, has the goal been achieved? Uh, well, it is much closer to collaboration among the various departments and agencies, especially the intelligence agencies, than it ever was prior to 9-11. And I might add that the creation of the Department of Homeland Security and eliminating the silos were slightly different enterprises because the issues with the silos had to do with intelligence agencies, okay? And the DHS was not created to crack the whip on them. And I wanna just tell you that when you go to a meeting as I would do for the counterterrorism security group and I represented DHS, I was the guy sitting at the far end of the cabinet table, the FBI, the CIA, the NSA, these were the big shots, okay? They're not listening a whole lot to the new guys on the block, okay? but. It is true that there's a lot of collaboration, but there has been a downside to this that's very interesting. And that is that there was this whole information sharing thing. We have to share information. More information has to be shared. We can't keep this only in our department. But what has happened as a result of that is they've set up systems in such a way that knuckleheads like Jack Tejera who should have no access to some of the information that he leaked online in Discord would have access to that. But it's not only him. I could list about seven or eight others. There was the young woman who had the unusual name. She realizes she screwed up, but she did the same thing. And she leaked information online. And there's others that have leaked things on WikiLeaks. Why? Because they had access to everything, even though they did not need it for their jobs. Because one of the fundamental precepts of intelligence, especially highly classified intelligence, is that it's not only need to know, but it's must know for your job. If you don't need to know it for your job, you should not have access. So we're having to look at going back now and reviewing the bidding on who has access and why. So I hope that answers your question. Go ahead, next question. Yes, I have a question about UFOs, even though it's a different, known by a different terminolo terminology now. Mm -hmm. um, so what intelligence, or has intelligence discovered anything significant uh, or credible about those objects that may or may not be around our Earth or our atmosphere? That's my question. Yeah, um, I, I really haven't studied that subject. Uh, in general, I would say no. However, uh, you would really want to look at, um, uh, I wish I could remember his name. There's a recent book by a very responsible, credible, not unusual, <laughs> uh, Twilight Zone sort of guy who has really done some deep research and, um, oh, sorry, I can't think of his name, but he, that book would be very interesting, interesting if you could read it. I, I can get that for you. If you want to give me your email afterwards or something, I, it, it, it'll come to me, it'll come to me in the car on the way home. That's usually how it works, Mark, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm sorry. I'm at the age now where I forget things, particularly names, and you know who really gets mad is when I forget Fran's name, my wife. She's <laughs> really makes her, really, I'm in the doghouse for a week after that. Bernie, go ahead. Question on the spy balloon, the Chinese spy balloon. I'm not sure where I'm looking here. If you raise your hand. in the back. Oh, in the back. Okay. In the cheap seats. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's where the scholars sit. <laughs> anyway, um, the Chinese balloon. Yes. Were they... Were the um, United States military successful in uh, securing the intellect, you know, intellectual capabilities of the equipment on that uh, balloon? You know, they haven't talked a lot about that, um, but they were successful in recovering what was left of the intelligence collection package. So my suspicion is they'll have some idea of what's there, uh, but how much is not something that they're sharing with retired 
federal employees who live in Oakmont. As much as I would love to still be on in the know, uh, unfortunately, and I'm sorry I can't give you a better answer, but I do know that, boy, they were Johnny on the spot to recover the, the, the not the balloon so much, but the uh, intelligence collection package and study it. Mark, here, Mark. Yes. Over here. Oh, Gordon. Hi. Uh, a comment about security at airports in the 90s, I think it was my second trip to Israel, and getting in the country, nothing. Coming out of the country, they pulled me out of line and started questioning me. And I was worried about making the flight. But this guy was going on, do you have family in Israel? How long were you here? Why were you here? I don't know why I was pulled out of line. I was getting very frustrated. I said, do you want to hear me do my barbaribus? <laughs> I can do it, still do that. Yeah. And he said, well, when if something happens to an LL plane coming in, it's the fault of the, the country it came from. If something happens from our plane leaving here, it's our fault. So we make, but I never know why he pulled me out. Yeah, and he's probably not going to elaborate. I want to make a couple comments about LL -El security, Israeli security. Those of us who've traveled to Israel, you know what that experience is. Uh, one small correction. Um, Planes, the LL planes coming into the country get just as much of the LL treatment, whether it's coming from LA or New York or San Francisco, as they do coming out of Israel. However, there are certain things that the local governments will not allow to be done. So the Israelis have workarounds. But here's the thing even before you show up to the airport, the Israelis have already done a lot of research on each of the passengers. You know, they've, they've done. Um, you know, sort of a background of, you know, name, who you are, and looking at all of their databases, intelligence databases, to see if there's a problem. I don't think that something triggered for you, but it could have, but that doesn't mean you're a bad guy. It's just something they have to resolve. Uh, so that's the best I can do on that. But I mean, I know how that is. And if they have anything that they think they're concerned about or what you're carrying in your suitcase or in your thing, you're really going to get the, the full Monty. So. Next question. I have, a, I have a question. Thank you for your presentation. I'm sorry. Back, again, I, back yeah, Mark. Yeah, I, uh, thank you. Would Homeland Security consider the events of January 6th a terrorist attack? Uh, oh, oh, January 6th attacking the, uh, the Capitol. Uh, you know, I can tell you that government people in all the years I've worked on this have spent hours and hours and written books and books and, and, and articles about what constitutes terrorism, what's terrorism, what's not terrorism, what is, is it something else, and so forth. So these are labels. Um, you know, the Department of Justice has taken the position that this is more like an insurrection than a terrorist attack. That's, I'm just telling you what the Department of Justice, the way they've looked at it in terms of their prosecutorial approach. But again, that is a question that is probably best asked to somebody from justice uh, or FBI. Um, and that's, I'm sorry, that's the best I can tell you. But I think it's more they're looking at it as insurrection rather than terrorism. Go ahead, Judy. Mark, you know, I loved your presentation, but honestly, it sounds like those were the good old days when our biggest terrorist threats were from afar. Do you think that they are looking at what might happen in the 2024 election, what kinds of things might go on? What do you think is happening in Homeland Security with respect to that? Okay, well, uh, again, I, I hate to uh, sort of correct the questioner, but it's very often been the case that there have been attacks and threats within the United States, not only from afar, but in the United States, okay, and I can list a number of them. You, you look at the 
attack in the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida. You look at the attack by ISIS sympathizers at the Inland Regional Center in San Bernardino, uh, to name two prominent examples that are more recent. Okay, so we still have, you know, terrorism threats uh, against Americans, American interests abroad, but also within the United States. And they are looking at those relentlessly. And they do a lot of interesting programs. But here's the intelligence challenge, because your question is really interesting. And uh, I, I addressed this, I think, in a previous speech a long time ago. Um, and that was the Ed Snowden speech, if anybody was around back then when I talked about that. Um, in the United States, because of certain constitutional considerations, we cannot do some of the same intelligence collection that we can do abroad, okay? And there is a whole um, industry of civil liberties and privacy people uh, jam-packed with lawyers who will be relentless about looking at anything the United States government does that might implicate the quote-unquote civil liberties as they define them of American citizens. However, the more you do that, the less ability the FBI or other intelligence, intelligence agencies have for uncovering uh, threats. It doesn't mean it's impossible. It doesn't mean they don't do a good job. But there is a tension here, isn't there, between protecting those civil liberties and privacy and having the information you need to be able to defend against threats. And so every person, every American citizen has to sort of decide for themselves what they uh, are willing to, what, what they want, you know, the, the security versus privacy and civil liberties thing. It, it shouldn't be that they would always be in tension, in, 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 in tension but the fact is that they are. And, and that is, uh, you know, that's the game right there. Yeah, that's very, very difficult challenge. Yeah, to to deal with. Do we have any other questions for Mark? Well, Mark, you just hit this one out of the ballpark too on number twelve, and we want to invite you back. Okay, can you come back. Great. Thank like you very much Mark. for coming today. We want to remind you we have another great presentation next Sunday. I know it's still playoffs, but we're getting in there as early as we can for you. So we hope to see you then, and until then, have a great week. <laughs>